really got me to thinking, what does a car mean to a human being? So, which is how I started off my journey in automobile engineering, thinking what exactly makes this car, you know, be a car and what powers it and what is it to the social standard of people? Why does one buy a car? Why does one buy this particular car? What's special in this particular model, which is not in that model? This led me to the automobile industry and then it has led me to be a product manager in the automotive industry. Okay. So uh, why why uh, this complete automobile industry has been so important? Well, automobiles are real, you know, it's a second investment for everybody, especially in our developing nation like India. So people do take a lot of interest in buying their cars or investing a lot of money in their cars. So they want the best out of everything. They want, you know, the best fuel efficiency, the safest. Now safety is becoming a real big factor. They want the safest car. They want the most fuel efficient car. They want the most powerful car. They want a car which is an extension of themselves. It should, it should portray the same characteristics which they have. Suppose you have a big and powerful person, like suppose say a big, big businessman. He would, he or she would want, you know, either a large SUV or a large luxury car or a person who's just finished their graduation might want a flashy sports car. And that is the challenge of the automobile industry is to cater to all the needs of these various customers. You know, the young person, the old person and the person who has to show a certain sense of luxury and power in their lives. So, and it also contributes a lot to the gross domestic product of the country, logically. So this is why it's a, such a huge part of people's lives. It's not only in India, it's in the whole world. Yeah, uh, I think automobile started as a as a part of convenience. Then it uh, made a shift to luxury. Right. And now if you think about, say, you know, the Cano model of things wherein something which is a luxury yesterday becomes a necessity today. So now th this is what the coronavirus pandemic has also said. You know, earlier you could just, you know, go around the town, go around the city in say an Ola or an Uber. But now you would think twice. You would even, you would not mind getting a second-hand car for personalized transport. So in this case sort of uh, VUCA world, personalized mobility has taken a real step in front and People want a car for themselves, not a bike, or maybe a bike, but now in this pandemic, they want a car by themselves and it has become a necessity. It's not a luxury anymore. It's become a necessity. Yeah. Uh, can you please elaborate that how this uh, complete automobile industry was uh, in, to, in 2010, like good 11 years back? A few years back, you know, we had very, very few players. Uh, how in the olden days you had, you know, very few companies, you had three companies in there. You had Premier, which is basically Fiat, you had Standard, and you had the Hindustan Motors. So you had, you know, people needed something new. People wanted to shift from that, which is why Maruti came into the picture with their new cars, their affordable cars, and then they gained, a, you know, a lion's share of the market, you know, around 50% market share is what they have. They still do and it's constantly climbing. Then you got players like Hyundai uh, from Korea who decided, okay, great, we also want to get a piece of this action. So they also came in and now they are the second biggest you know, players in India. So they have a consistent market share about say 20 to 25 percentage. And then uh, once we come to the 2025s, we'll talk about how a single player you know, with what just one single model in one year gained 5% market share. So back in 2010, people were moving from being some of the things which were luxurious became more the better or they would buy the car if it is there. You know, it came into that sort of a segment. So you had cars moving from traditional petrols to a sort of a hybrid, but still they had you know, regular petrol vehicles or regular diesel vehicles, albeit with a lot of luxurious touches from the Mercedes or the BMWs of that era. 
So from ne bare necessity transport, it moved to slightly uh, luxurious or step below. And cars went from being three to four lakhs uh, starting to around seven to eight lakhs starting. And now it's been almost 10 lakhs. We want a decent, safe, you know, performance car, a decent performance car. So uh, while we were in uh, 2010, I believe uh, in, in, in BMWs and Audis and Jaguars, they were uh, they were a very, very big thing. Exactly. Like, yes, yes, if yes. You, if you ever used to see any of those cars on road and so it, it was not that that familiar. People were not Correct. even familiar, familiar with all those brands. In small towns, I still remember it was a big, big thing at that point of time. Right, right, right. now, in small cities, in we have all these big Correct. brands running around the road right. like yes. very yes. normal days. Even in my yeah, even in my town, I mean, right when Bharat Benz, uh, you know, was introduced, you know, the big uh, truck and bus maker back in you know those days, uh, it was very very new truck unproven technology for the indian conditions but then in germany bus every single truck out there is in mercedes but now when you go to Kunur, which is my town every single tipper there would be a bharat benz mercedes tipper for the you know the t estates and stuff so all the t estate all in lorries are bharat benz most of them very very few are still the tata with the cummins engines so this is this from the various uh, corners of the country. You would find people, you would find customers who you won't even think would buy a Bharat Benz to own, say, a fleet of you know luxury, luxury brands. You're right. You're right. I, I still feel that thing that okay. And then coming back, coming back from 2010, like how how was it expected in 2015? And how did it up? Did it was it like that only, or was it was something that was not expected? Right. So coming back to you know what really governs the automotive industry. So automobiles, we have to say it, are polluting the environment. So there are a large set of regulations which have come into place, uh, like the BS five regulations, which was supposed to come, but it did not happen. We leapfrog directly from BS4 to BS6 right last year. And I have to tell you, the two-wheeler industry for the uh, every every bike or scooter which is churned out of the plants is BS6 compliant. And that is the highest standard of emissions in the whole world. We are even higher than Europe. So a bike coming out of European factory or a Japanese factory would be polluting the environment more than a bike which is coming out of an Indian factory. Okay. So BS5 regulations were supposed to come out, but they did not come out. We were still in BS4 in lots of you know, metropolitan cities. And then it, it was still BS3 in a lot of places. Then in 26, 2017, BS4 rolled out. BS4 from a BS3 standpoint was not that difficult because it just entailed slight changes in the you know catalytic converter exhaust or some other, uh, you know, like calibration had to be done in the engine side. That's all. You didn't have to, you know, change the way your engine combusts. You didn't have to change because you would have slightly lesser of a particular content of the fuel. Like, for example, the diesel cars ran on a higher content of sulfur in the diesel fuels a long time ago. But now you have ultra low sulfur fuels in the BS6 era. So this also poses another issue. Can older cars run on these ultra low sulfur grade fuels? You know, because they were designed to run on higher sulfur. Why am I harping on the sulfur? Is because it's a great lubricant. You know, your fuel pumps require lubrication. Your injectors require lubrication. Diesel itself inherently is an oil which will lubricate, but not to that a great extent. It did because of the sulfur. Now, when there is no sulfur, you either need highly sophisticated, frictionless, uh, you know, materials to aid lubrication, or an additive to be put to aid in your lubrication. So this was the shift which was supposed to happen. It did not happen. It happened a few years later in 2020. 
where every single car, bike, bus, truck, scooter, whatever you name it, had to be BS6 compliant, which is the highest standard of emission regulation in the whole country. And for two wheelers sake, highest in the whole world. Okay, okay. So uh, in, in 2020 and 2015, I think the biggest, biggest move was uh, moving from petrol to BS4 diesel. to BS6. Uh, yes. BS4 to BS6, yes, yes. In, in, in layman language, of course, I would say that. Correct, yes, yes. Yeah. That, that was the biggest shift. So, uh, how how did it impact the economy and how what was planned out of this? Well, for one, they decided to be on par with the European regulations, which is Euro 6. So, BS6 is literally the same regulations as Euro 6. But since our average speed of you know driving our vehicles is lesser, slight tweaks had to be done. Therefore, um, you know, leapfrogging directly from four to six was a real tough challenge. And if you compare a BS4 vehicle and a BS6 vehicle, a lot of features which you get, you know, as in, in infotainment or ventilated seats, you would not find in the BS6. Because so just the technology to power the engine and treat the exhaust gases that come out of it were so high that they had to delete some of these other features to, you know, uh, manage the costs. So the economy was impacted in a high, you know, in a large way, in a big way. And, you know, people started buying lesser and lesser cars, but they couldn't, you know, there was no other choice for them. They had to buy a car. They became a necessity because of the pandemic. But then the used car market was booming like crazy. There were more used cars being sold uh, than, you know, new cars in certain tier two and tier three cities. So this is the thing. You need to meet regulations, but it should be economical and it shouldn't be in such a way that will burn a hole in your pocket. Yeah, because uh, I think it was the move, the shift was there and uh, suddenly there was this that uh, maybe the diesel is cheaper, but then again, the model, the variant is a little expensive. Exactly. Every, yes. Every model had this variant that uh, okay, this is petrol variant, this is yeah. this is diesel variant, and then they had their correct. other other different versions of correct, it. correct, correct. So you might see petrol being around 90, 97 rupees regular petrol. I think yesterday it touched hundred and one rupees per liter in certain parts of Mumbai, every which day, is really every hard. Day. Exactly, yeah. it's, it's really you know heartbreaking to you know be the. If, Driving is the one thing for me personally which clears my head every single time I want, you know, some sort of, you know, happiness or peace of mind. I take my car and go for a drive. But now, because of the fuel prices skyrocketing, I, it, you know, I have to find some other hobby to do. <laughs> you are right. Actually, everybody, everybody, whenever anybody uh, is trying to plan something and trying to try to go for a trip this becomes a very important aspect exactly that okay correct, correct, correct. and i but think one thing which is impacting the you know regulation standpoint is that is there is no proper roadmap you know there is no proper five year or ten year plan you know, just yesterday they said they're going to be mixing ethanol in the fuel if they mix ethanol in the fuel the entire engine would have to be you know, redesigned to ensure that your hoses or your pipes don't, um, you know, get affected by the extra moisture content in the ethanol. So, as it is, they've invested so much in going from BS4 to BS6. Again, another investment from, you know, regular petrol or regular diesel to ethanol blended petrol and diesel, it would just break the industry. Nobody would buy cars anymore. You would find, you know, used car sales going up like crazy and new car sales coming down like anything so there I, should I, be a proper roadmap i think uh, because of this pandemic like my next question was this only that uh, what was about to like in 2015 it was expected that we would make a shift from petrol to diesel but it happened a little right. later it happened as yeah. you suggested yeah. that it happened it in 2017 or 18 so uh, I think uh, during 2020, we had this thing in mind very clear that we would be having those electric cars 
running around. Correct, correct, correct. What happened? I, I believe two, three variants are available in the market, but still, it's not have gained that popularity. Was it was yes. it because of the yes. pandemic, or is is the system failing? Uh, the problem is there were two, you know, laws. It's not laws, you could say. There were two programs. It's called faster adoption for uh, electric vehicles, phase one and phase two. These two schemes by the government were supposed to reduce the prices for electric vehicles in India. They were supposed to make electric vehicles more affordable. Because what is the problem with EVs? What is the inherent problem? Is that the batteries are very expensive. The batteries cost more than half the price of the car and have to be replaced every five years, which is impossible. So the cheapest EV on sale would be uh, in the car side would be a Tata Nexon, which is around 20, 25 lakhs. So just think about this. Your investment every five years for that electric car would be 10 lakhs minimum because you have to change the battery. It's not as if you just go into the petrol bank and say, okay, give me new fuel. You know, it's it's not like that. It's 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 really difficult. Plus, the electricity that we are putting into the electric cars, it is not renewable. It's not from renewable sources. You still burn coal, and you know geothermal energy to get sorry thermal energy to get electricity. So that is inherently very unclean, and it still causes global warming. So, in a case wherein you make your electricity through renewable sources like wind tidal, uh, you know, geothermal, biomass and stuff, then and only then is it sensible in buying and driving an electric car. Until then, it is it is as bad as driving a diesel car. So as per you, if you want to rate all these three variants, one is, uh, which would you opt for? Uh, now, actually, I will not buy a car in 2025. <laughs> Because that is when there is a proper, you know, change in the regulations which is supposed to come. You know, we thought BS6 stage 1 was bad in 2020. BS6 stage 2 is going to be even worse. Because every car is supposed to comply with another set of regulations. And then yesterday it was announced that ethanol is also going to be coming into the mix in 2023. So I'm giving the car makers a couple of, you know, years to, you know, buffer period of two years. So 2023, you will find people, you know, car makers complying to the regulations. But then the features might be as bad as what you get now, you know, because just to compensate for the cost. So 2023 will go on like that. 2024, you will have some upgradations in certain features. 2025 is the time I would buy any sort of car. I prefer a petrol. I do not like a diesel car. I prefer a petrol. But then if there are, you know, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, I would get that. Provided the hydrogen infrastructure also improves in the country as like the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Okay, this is something new because uh, I have seen people preferring diesel cars over petrol cars. And then correct, uh, correct. But you just changed my whole perception about it. So you would rate uh, above would be on the top. It would be, I think, electric car. And then you would prefer a petrol car. And that is something new that the last would be. Correct. The yes. Yes. Because the problem is diesel cars inherently would be more expensive. But now since petrol, uh, you know, smaller engines with turbocharging and direct injection, higher pressure engines are coming up. It is almost, you know, 50 percentage closer to a diesel car's price. So let's take a diesel car at 20 lakhs and a petrol car at 15 lakhs. You might be spending a lot lesser on diesel, even though the diesel petrol price deficit is around, uh, I think, seven rupees. Earlier, it used to be 30 or 40 rupees per liter difference. But now it's around seven or eight rupees. So even though you do that, your initial investment is going to be five lakhs more. And for you to make that cost up, and diesel cars are very expensive to maintain because there's a lot of maintenance which has to be done on the fuel injectors, the uh, oil seals, the diesel oil itself, the engine oil itself is inherently very expensive. So for all the maintenance and the fuel costs which you have to calculate, it might be 15 to 20 years until you get that money back. 
But in the meantime, you will be spending a lot more on maintenance than a petrol car. Plus, petrol car's performance is you know very very good. Fuel efficiency might not be as good as diesel, uh, but then I would prefer a petrol car any day because whatever fuel, whatever petrol, BS6, BS7, BS8, BS9, whatever petrol you put it in, even in a BS2 petrol car, it will still run. But the BS6 diesel, you put it in a BS2 or a BS3 diesel car, it will struggle. It will struggle a lot. So you mean to say the entire structure of the diesel car is not quite up to the mark? Is it? Is is that I should conclude from this? You know, because the thing I is, uh, customer demand is for a diesel car because the old diesel cars were more efficient, were more fuel efficient, were more thermally efficient, and they could just keep going for a long time. Whether your diesel was contaminated with something, or you could even throw in. Uh, biodiesel and the car would keep running but that was the olden days now petrols are also equally as efficient as diesels some very very rare cases higher more efficient than diesels plus the maintenance factor is why people should prefer petrols but they prefer diesels because of the older way of thinking so the takeaway would be petrols for a cleaner and uh, you know, a risk-free uh, mode of operation. Diesels for you know a slightly dirtier operation because of the uh, fumes and the uh, maintenance. But with BS6, it's cleaner but very very expensive. And electric vehicles, once all the infrastructure develops, preferably you could go for an EV. Okay, so the infrastructure has to be there for the EV, right? Exactly, exactly. Which is yes, we yes. Uh, we I think we are not uh, on that. Uh, yeah. Way no, right. We're not on par. Yeah. The two schemes by the government have not uh, succeeded, I could say, if I may be so bold, have not succeeded. Okay, okay, okay. Good, Nishan. So these were my questions. And if you could explain us something more from your, your side, it would be really nice. Sure, sure. Uh, I have prepared a small sort of PPT to, you know, you an idea of what is actually happening in the industry, what is going to happen. So let me just share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? No, not yet. I think it probably might take a little time. Uh, can you bring the second one to the last uh, Is it visible now? Um, is it visible now? Uh, is my screen visible? I'm not able to hear you. Shant, your screen was visible. Oh, right. Okay. Now it's not visible. One second, let me try again. Is it visible now? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. So, uh, let's carry on. Oh, uh, what do we wish to say by, you know, going through this? There are a lot of disruptors which are happening, which would, you know, uh, change the industry and turn it to its head. I have put automotive industry 
options as a first. Then we would see about emerging trends. Then it would be XEV, hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles, past, present, future technology. And finally, we'll go on to a research paper which I was doing. And then we could have a small quest answer session because there's paucity of time. Okay, okay. that's what's happened first. Conferences. And it basically means CASE, connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. So connected car basically means a car which is connected to other cars and you know the internet via your smartphone or an embedded eSIM. So whether you want to go out for say a coffee shop somewhere, you would say car take me to a coffee shop and it would calculate, if it's an electric car, it would uh, calculate the distance and see whether there is a charging point nearby, see whether you have enough charge, enough range to take you to the coffee shop and back to your home. Or it will scout out for a charging point first and then go there or a coffee shop with the charging point so that you have a complete range or say a complete tank of fuel uh, to continue on your journey. Plus, we are all addicted to our smartphones nowadays, right? So right. our smartphones are connected to the uh, car itself through an embedded eSIM. So it would give us updates like, uh, you know, our fastest route home or fastest route to our office and whether we could save on fuel by driving a bit better, it would take in uh, driving inputs and see whether we're doing we're driving well or driving badly. It would give us, you know, a score on which we can improve, stuff like that. So coming to the autonomous side of things, you would have seen that a couple of weeks ago, Beijing, uh, you know, in China, launched uh, a driverless autonomous car taxi service. Now that is done through a wide range of LiDAR sensors, cameras, and obviously being connected to the internet. So this is how, you know, you can have a meeting in your car on your way to the office or you know, school and you could get a lot more work done on your journey and the car would just drive itself and they don't even have they've reached a level where they don't even have people required to take control of the car where, when you know an accident when an accident occurs because it is taught mitigation techniques to prevent one prevent the accident from happening and also uh, keep the occupants safe in the event of an accident by either swerving or braking later or by communicating to other cars so that every car knows what to do in the case of an accident. Uh, coming to the last picture, which is you know a very, very famous name in the world of electric vehicles, Tesla. Uh, Tesla is the pioneer in electric vehicles. You know, electric vehicles which are powered by Tesla cells, you know, uh, proprietary batteries which Tesla makes. And those are the highest performance uh electric cars in the market right now apart from say a porsche taycan but it is very 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 innovative let's move on to the next slide now these are the emerging trends which every connected car or connected autonomous shared vehicle should have so internet of things machine learning and ai these three things these three skills are very much required for a person who is an engineer or a person who you know wants to uh, make his or her mark in the world of automobile engineering. Internet of things wherein every single device is connected to each other via the internet you know to improve upon their accuracy and precision in their tasks and you know uh, improve their uh, customer satisfaction and customer experience. Artificial intelligence is also an upcoming field, as is machine learning, where you actually teach a machine how to interpret a situation and mitigate it. And we finally come to an, the fourth industrial revolution, where we are in a stage wherein machines connected to the internet again, uh, like smart factories uh, or IoT with machine learning autonomous systems, can actually repair themselves or stop the production line in the case of one of them having an accident. Mm -hmm. So we've come to a stage wherein earlier you had people with steam power and mechanization 
moving on to an assembly line with mass production and then automation that was with humans now it is completely automated which which finally moves on to the robots themselves you know uh, thinking of and uh, neutralizing a threat even before it actually happens or in the inevitable case that the threat actually happens it knows to repair itself moving further we've come to the topic of the webinar what exactly is xev what do you put in this you know x space so x can stand for b h p h or fc what is b battery so b e v battery electric vehicle an electric vehicle whose power source is a battery next would be a hybrid electric vehicle a hybrid electric vehicle would have two power sources one an internal combustion engine either petrol or diesel then an electric motor so it uses both in different ways to power the vehicle next would be a plug in hybrid electric vehicle so what does this mean uh you have again a combustion you have two modes of power uh, an internal combustion engine and you know the electric motor but then here the engine doesn't power the battery you have to uh, plug in it plug in the vehicle to a power socket to charge the battery and then you could either go fully electric or uh, electric assisted you know driving via the uh, petrol or diesel engine finally this is the future of you know mobility which is a fuel cell electric vehicle so basically it is an electric vehicle run by motors and controllers but the power source is a hydrogen fuel cell so hydrogen fuel cell acts the same way as a battery but you know but through a, a series of redox reactions reduction oxidation reactions uh, with the catalyst they you know produce electricity and it is it is how they break down the hydrogen into its main constituents is how they do that so what do you need for this you need for a battery electric vehicle you need a charging station a hybrid you would just need you know a petrol or a diesel station plug in hybrid you would need a charging station and a petrol or a diesel station and the fuel cell electric vehicle you will need a hydrogen filling station going on what exactly is a hybrid and what exactly is an electric vehicle so you would have seen this car you know many a time to the prius was the originator of the uh, originator and pioneer of the hybrid vehicle uh, scenario toyota prius is a very well known name and the electric vehicle you know well known electric vehicle in india is the tata nexon so the hybrid is powered by an electric motor or a petrol or a diesel engine in india you do not get a discount when you buy a hybrid vehicle but it does have uh, more range than an internal combustion engine but it is more expensive than an internal combustion engine moving on to the electric vehicle an electric vehicle is solely powered by an electric motor you do get a discount when you uh, you know uh, by purchase an electric vehicle in the united kingdom alone you get 5 lakhs back from the government when you purchase an electric vehicle but the main drawback is that you can you cannot go as far as you want like a petrol vehicle you have to go lesser which is you know uh, which means it's got lesser range than an internal combustion engine and it is very expensive and it all comes down to the battery pack it is more expensive than the internal combustion engine and the hybrid vehicle so hybrids are the immediate solution which is happening now and electric vehicles are the long term solution but why do i have an asterisk there it's because the asterisk is for a fuel cell so fuel cell electric vehicles are the future now we go on to the classification of hybrids based on architecture there are basically four one is a series one is a parallel one is a series parallel and one is a complex hybrid so what exactly is a series hybrid you have a fuel tank which powers the ic engine the ic engine does nothing but generate electricity to charge a battery and the battery charges the or uses the power for an electric motor and the electric motor powers the car 
in a parallel hybrid, you have the same battery electric motor setup, but you also have an IC engine which parallelly runs the vehicle. So you can either run on the engine or the battery with the motor. Now here is where things get complicated. In a series parallel hybrid, you can either run the car with the battery alone or the fuel tank alone, I mean the IC engine alone, or you can also have instances wherein the IC engine charges the battery while it runs the car. So this is a you know, complex sort of scenario. And finally, we come to the last one, which is a complex hybrid. So you can have either the engine only powering the car or the motor only powering the car or the motor powering the car only in certain circumstances while in slow speed excuse me or supporting the uh, acceleration of the vehicle or you can have the petrol engine charging the battery always and only the electric motor kicking in when you need extra boost so there are a lot of complexities in the aptly named complex hybrid mm -hmm. Uh, let's move on. Now, based on the level of what hybrids are, you have different varieties. Basically, you have four varieties. One is a micro hybrid, which is split into a start stop system and an ISG hybrid, a mild hybrid, and a full hybrid. So, you, this would have, this is be probably hard to believe, but the Scorpio was the India's first mild hybrid, or you could say micro hybrid because it featured a start-stop system. You know, automatically when you come to a set of traffic lights, the car stops by itself and when you press the clutch in again, the car automatically starts. So why is this done? When the car is idling, there is a lot of pollution being, you know, emitted from the exhaust pipe. So which is why uh, in the tests, this actually increases the fuel efficiency by a lot, by say three to 5%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the motor which is there is very, very small. So moving on to the ISG hybrid, you would have seen Maruti's revolutionary SHVS system, which is a hybrid system, wherein the starter motor itself regenerates some of the uh, thermal energy lost due to braking and converts it into electrical energy. So this might give you some extra input during acceleration, but it cannot power the car fully. Which is why we come to the next car, wherein you can either have the petrol engine powering the car throughout or the electric motor powering the car throughout. Finally, we come to the full hybrid and this Toyota Camry is a 2020 model, which is a self-charging hybrid, which means you have an Atkinson cycle 2000cc petrol engine just acting as a generator and propelling the car is an electric motor, which is powered by a set of lithium ion batteries under the rear seat. So all that the engine has to do is power the batteries. That's all. And the car moves on through electric power. Now we come on various components in the electric vehicle. So obviously the battery is the main part of the electric vehicle, which is called a traction battery, which makes up, you know, 50% of the cost of the car. Then you have an electric motor, which is called traction motor. Then you have various controllers and inverters to control how the batteries and the motor works. We obviously cannot have, and the voltage range for this will be around higher than 200 to 300 volts. But you cannot have 200, 300 volt systems powering a music system or the headlamps, which is why you have inverters or step down transformers and DC DC converters. So a battery is a thing which is very hot, so it needs thermal cooling to prevent itself from exploding. And you also have an additional battery for uh, you know, onboard system like headlamps, you know, OBD, onboard diagnostics. And finally, to charge the system, you need a charger. Now, what happened in the past? What is currently happening? And what are the future demands? So in the past, you relied on petrol only or diesel only to power your vehicle. It was not good for the environment. The dependence on electronics was very low because you only knew how to control your fuel pumps and you know injectors through mechanical means. And there was absolutely no connectivity. There wasn't even a cassette player those days in cars. 
and obviously, though these uh, technologies, because of the reason why these technologies weren't there, it was a very low price. Currently, we rely on fuel plus a battery. What does that mean? So most cars nowadays are hybrid cars. It is good for the environment in the sense that is they, we have a lot of smaller engines producing lesser emissions by consuming lesser fuel. And the battery, of course, is environmentally bad, but it is better than the olden days wherein you had no regulations to emissions and such. The dependence on electronics is high because you would have to you you would need a controller which decides what source powers the car, either the diesel, petrol engine, or the what do you call uh, traction motor. Connectivity is moderate, fine. You you, you have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto for your uh, cars, you might have an embedded eSIM in most cars, which is why connectivity is high. And now since the battery, the motor, all these extra things are there in your car, the price is high. The future is hydrogen because hydrogen burns clean and the only emission you might have is obviously a lot of water, but you would have slightly high NOx emissions, which is there in diesels of today as well. It is, you know, very good in being environmentally friendly. The dependence on electronics is very, very high because you need a very complex monitoring system for to ensure that hydrogen does not leak and the batteries are being maintained at a proper temperature and state of charge. Obviously, you need high connectivity because we are bound to see autonomous cars in the future. So every car should be able to talk to itself. And obviously, since you have all these things, uh, a consumer, a private consumer might not be able to buy a car. You would have taxi fleets and they would own the cars and then rent them out on a monthly or weekly basis, which is why the price is very high. So the past, I would say, was an ambassador, the present is a hybrid and the future is, you know, a hydrogen fuel cell. Now, this is one of my research areas which I had done, which was on a hybrid motorcycle. So. You might be thinking, you have hybrid cars, you have hybrid trucks, why not a hybrid motorcycle? So, which is why I decided on using a single cylinder engine with the primary drive attached to an alternator to produce, to convert mechanical energy to electrical energy. Then it is powered, your power is given to a battery pack through electrical connections connected to the electric hub motor, the rear wheel. And that is what powers the motorcycle. So, it's a series hybrid layout. So what are the specifications you might ask? So it's a standard and plus this is a biodiesel engine. So therefore it is slightly better on the environment as well. So you have around, you know, I'll take one of the examples, you know, 8 HP, you know, engine, 8 horsepower engine, 4 capacity, uh, I mean 4 kilowatt hour battery pack, 6.7 horsepower motor because that was what was required to propel the bike. Uh, a charge time of 40 minutes and the fuel required for one charge is around 0.42 of a liter. So the theoretical range on one charge, you know, one battery charge would be 31 kilometers. So you still have a fuel tank charging the battery. So the number of times the battery pack can be charged around 31. So, so for one tank of fuel, you can go 980 kilometers. All this is very theoretical and I plan to, you know, uh, put this in practice and see what a prototype does. So how might this work? You fuel the diesel tank, the engine charges the battery, the battery powers the motor and the motor moves the motorcycle. Now once the battery depletes, the engine will recharge the battery, the battery again powers the motor and the motor again moves the motorcycle. So this is how it works until you have to refill in your tank with biodiesel. So this was about it. I thank you very much for your time. We can have the question a session from the audience. And I've also put in my contact details if you would like to contact me later. Thank you, Nishan. That was really enlightening and uh, it was a beautiful PPT and you just walked us through the complete journey of how it was and where it will, uh, we are right now and where we are leading in the future. So uh, I think this, uh, Nishant, you are not audible.
Yeah. Any... Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one last question that is quite relevant for all of our students who are just watching this. Uh, what are the skill set that uh, right now they should acquire or start working on it that would help them in uh, because all the engineers they would pass out in next year or maybe in two, two, two to three years. So right, what are right. the skill sets they need to work and uh, uh, what are the areas they can explore? So that yes. they can uh, right. Um, electronics is a main area which everybody should know. You can't just say I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm an automobile engineer, I don't know electronics. So it shouldn't be that because now every single thing is being electrified. You know, in the future in India, you might not see every car being an electric vehicle, but you will still see petrol and diesel cars being electrified to improve the emission standards. You know, just through electronics. You can do a lot of control, um, you know, systems which will help out in various things, even improve the driving nature of the cars. So electronics is, is one such area which everybody is supposed to uh, have at least some sort of idea on. Plus with cars going to being connected vehicles, you are supposed to know a great deal of, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and internet of things as well okay. plus it's not only the technical skills which person needs you're still supposed to have a lot of management skills like uh, you know lean six sigma project management and um, you know design thinking you should also have the empathy that you should work in a cross-functional team you shouldn't say my job is to design the exhaust system I don't care whether this design is like this and it hampers the electric uh, team's capability to introduce a sensor which might help in uh, getting the job done better. So they should, you know, design in such a way that in everybody knows what they're doing. Every single member of the cross-functional team and by cross-functional team, I mean one automobile person, one electrical person, one marketing person, one CSE, uh, one manager, one accounts. All these people should pitch in their ideas and you know we should be open to getting their ideas to improve upon our product so design thinking is really one uh, you know area plus you know uh, collaborative thinking is also an area which really has to be worked on okay so thank you so much sandeep i think uh, we all all had a lot of lot of from this session and Nishant, I would really, really thank you for this this beautiful and insightful uh, journey you took us through. And thank you, students, for watching us live. And uh, I think we can take a 10 minutes break and then we have Mr. Sandeep waiting for us. Thank you so much, Nishant. Thank you so much, team. Thank you so much, for SIET College, for helping us do this. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank Dr. Prabhakar, who you know, introduced me to Mr. Vignesh so we could have this session today. Uh, nice meeting everybody. Thank you very much.